everybody. Uh, I think this session don't have a lot of people. Uh, perhaps uh, there's another concurrent session that is more popular. But um, welcome. So today we want to talk about um, how the development sector is uh, quite dysfunctional, the social development sector, and what is happening and why we started Catalyst 2030 so that we can change that from silos to co collaboration. So every year, there's about 150 billion US dollar of donation given out to developing countries from country donors, which is the big one, as well as um, philanthropic money. There's also individual charity donation. So roughly, you can say it's a between $150 billion uh, to around $200 billion. And yet, every year, we continue to see 4 billion poor people. So why does all this donation not change, uh, move the needle? In many cases, these are one-off. That means it is charity buying that does not build capacity on the ground and it makes people continuously dependent on the next year supply of money again. The overheads of operating NGOs, charity buying, uh, has to go through a lot of channels and each channel takes an operating overhead and eventually the dollar becomes 50 cents and becomes 20 cents on the ground. So this kind of economy is really quite inefficient. If this is run like a business, it would have gone bankrupt all the time, but it doesn't. It continues to survive and the next year there's another $150 billion donation again. So this is, if a newcomer come to the sector, they'll find a very, very strange marketplace because it is not a marketplace. So who has actually got their country out of poverty? I came from Singapore and we turned from third world to first world without any donation. In fact, we refused foreign aid when our GDP is only 500 US dollars per capita per year, the same as Kenya in 1965. China copied the Singapore model and also got 700 million people out of poverty in the last 30 years. Singapore is now one of the top five highest income per capita in the world. The countries that continue to receive donation continues to be poor. Cambodia, Africa. So what we think is that there are about 4,000 social entrepreneurs who has already proven business model, but they were all working in silos up till now. And if we can harness their business model and replicate them everywhere, then all the good ideas can be recycled and reused. To this end, we have started a group called Catalyst 2030. And the purpose of Catalyst 2030 is to share all our resources, our assets, our knowledge, our contacts, our network to solve this poverty all together. And today we have uh, two other panelists. Anand, he is, uh, I would like him to, ex uh, to introduce himself because I wouldn't want to say the wrong thing. <laughs> then uh, Arthur Wood uh, from Geneva. Anand, you are from uh, Seattle right now, right? And I'm right. in Singapore. Um, each of us will speak 
15 minutes and then we will discuss uh, with you what is the problem of the social development industry, how is the end vision going to look like, and how are we going to solve this problem within this hour. And if we are able to give you a clear idea, then uh, you can also continue to join us in conversation. So first I will ask Anand to tell us if everything is right, how will the end vision look like and how he is going to, uh, from his angle, make this happen. So Anand, uh, please introduce yourself and then tell us your vision. Yeah. Um, Jack, I had a suggestion, since we are only a small number of people, would it make sense to give, you know, see, just have everybody briefly introduce themselves so we know who's, that's the advantage of having an intimate It's group. good, but I think you need to introduce yourself okay. first. I'll do that. Then uh, they, they will join, right? Yes. Right. Okay. Um, so, hi, I'm Anand. I'm uh, in Seattle. I'm, um, I'm a partner in a firm called Socion. We focus on um, social impacts. Uh, basically, we started with the idea of you know, the question that we were faced with is why do so many initiatives around the world, particularly social impact initiatives, end up being pilots in the eyes of the problem? Meaning that most of them lurk in the two to three percent of the target population that they themselves decide need their support, right? Um, and why do they lounge there at the two to three percent? And why are we not able to break that barrier and reach everyone that needs um, the, the equity, justice, support, services, whatever we might feel is the problem? Um, so that's the background. And then since then, we've also realized that digital is a um, significant new possibility today. The time is right, the capabilities are there, the infrastructure is there. Um, the mindset is there for us to be able to leverage that. So how are we leveraging digital in a responsible way? Um, to aid in restoring the agency of individuals in these communities to do the kind of things that they aspire to do um, in, in the context in which that they live. So this is the context that we've been uh, thinking about. So when we started, so this is briefly my background. Um, so taking a cue from our captain here, so I'm just going to go ahead and give you the idea that we have, and then I would love to know who's in the audience. So can I share a slide, uh, Jack? Is that okay? I'm just a bit of a visual person. Uh, Ranjani, would you be able to let me share the screen? Oh, there you go. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I've made it. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. So I just have a couple of ideas that we are pursuing uh, in a number of conversations. The first challenge, if we were to, and, and by the way, you know, Jack talks about the outsider. I feel like I'm an outsider. I'm new to the social sector, less than four years old started with a, with a volunteering gig and now we we'll start an organization and we work in water, natural resource management, healthcare. We're currently working in India with one state around public finance management, reimagining public finance management. We're also working in livelihoods and a few other areas, right? Um, so one big observation that we had since we work across sectors was this thing called situational awareness. Now, this is a terrible example, but imagine sending uh, an army, this is a word that I hear a lot in the military thing, but imagine sending an army to go fight a battle when they have no idea who else is around them, right? So, but then you look at social sector and we see organizations going into communities to support with no understanding of who else is operating there, who else has been there before, what others are doing uh, and what they have done. So they tend to start uh, from scratch. They tend to train new people. They, we find that they don't often leverage the people that have already been trained in the last 20 years before them. If you take um, conversations around water, sanitation, health, these are not new topics. These are very traditional. There's a lot of traditional knowledge. There's a lot of training that has happened over the past decades. But it seems like every new initiative starts from scratch. Um, it's quite frustrating, uh, quite challenging, but in many cases, quite hard to actually understand what is around you when you go into those communities. So this is one huge problem. It's a massive reason, in our opinion, for the kind of inefficiencies that we cannot afford in this sector. The second pet peeve that I have that I think is huge is if you look at pilots, whether you look at small social initiatives or large government programs or institutionally funded programs, 
the interesting thing is, you know, I love Jack's analogy of nature. I don't know if you've heard Jack talk about this, but he says that everything living, everything dead, everything shifts, right? Is that right, Jack? And yeah. he said that, that that then becomes nutrients and those nutrients are used by something else to create something that may not look like the one that gave the nutrients out. So there is an ecosystem effect where things that live, things that die, give out nutrients, which are then used by others to regenerate and create things that were previously unimagined. Well, it turns out all of the initiatives we work on, small pilots, large programs, generate some common nutrients. And these are, they generate data, they about, for example, water quality data, water quantity data, location of springs, uh, you know, healthcare assessments, um, you know, so on and so forth. So there are artifacts that are created, maps, reports, etc. There are lots of people that have been trained over the years, practitioners who have some amazing skills, including, you know, how to diagnose TB, to bookkeeping, to uh, God knows what else, right? Hydrogeology. Um, and all of these artifacts and practitioners and data reside within the silos that they're created in. Very rarely are these usable or available. People talk about them, but I mean, I can bet you that I've been around uh, now enough uh, organizations to realize they're apparently there, but they're not available. They're not accessible. And data is very strange that even though one organization claims they have that data, no other organization will use that data to make a decision. Like if your organization goes out and measures the quality of water, and I come two months later, I cannot put medicine in that water based on your quality measurement. I have to measure it all over again. Why? Because there is no trust in that data. My ability to defend my actions based on your data is very limited in today. So we tried to understand this. And we said that just like, you know, uh, in, in the modern world, areas where we have solved some problems, there is some sense of plumbing. There are roads that we create. There is infrastructure that allows all of these things to operate on top of. We don't have such rich infrastructure in the social ecosystem that allows for data to flow and be trusted across silos that allows practitioners in, trained in one program to be leveraged by another program that allows artifacts that are created in one community to be leveraged by somebody else that visits that community to understand what the situation is so they can start further along in the journey right nor are people aware of these outcomes today there's a lot of geotagging etc that's happening but the the metadata about that uh, asset is not known People can't tell you how much quantity of water capacity for storage exists today in these communities. Um, you have to really work hard to try and figure that out before you start any water security programs. So if you were to think about this, it's really, we have a tendency as an ecosystem to see the problem as getting from point A to point B. And we all build cars and we throw cars into the ecosystem, but we're not building roads. Now imagine what happens if everybody keeps building more cars and nobody is worrying about building roads. Right. So with that, I'm going to stop and give it back to you, Jack. But I would say that these are two very big, I mean, there are other challenges, but I thought we are working on and are very interested in solving these two problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would really like uh, everybody to ask questions and you can use the chat function to ask your question. Um, this this current situation is that the development, social development sector is very fragmented and everybody is trying to please the funder rather than solve the problem. And the funders have pet projects. Some like children, some like girls, some like water. And then each of them are doing pilots. And every year you keep doing pilots, but you do not continuously build the capacity and leave so that the people were able to do it themselves. So uh, next speaker, we will ask Arthur to introduce himself and also give us his vision, how we are going to draw the roadmap so that we are able to bring in every resource like Arthur, uh, like Anand said, keep all the records of who is doing what, where, to what extent, and then what do they need 
and what can they offer? Arthur, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Jack. I will have a quick presentation to share. Um, my background is I worked in the city of London for 23 years. I used to be head of product development and e-commerce for one of the major uh, investment banks. And some of the uh, element that I'll present to you today is actually based on what the banking sector did uh, a long time ago. Indeed, much of what I will say is what the commercial sector uh, has already done. So the good news is, let's start on the good news, uh, is that a lot of uh, what we talk about has actually been built in other sectors of the economy. Um, after that, I, I had the pleasure of working for Ashoka, uh, heading up what was called Social Financial Services, um, under which ages, for what it's worth, we did the bl first blended value model, we conceptualized the social impact bond, the development impact bond, uh, and work with the former head of the exempt unit of the IRS changing some legislation. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the work I've been doing for roughly the last 22 months uh, with some of the individuals that are involved in, uh, in Convergence, which is the work of 22 organizations in four integrated work, work streams, metrics, legal, finance, and technology. Let's see if I can share my screen. Uh, where are we? There we go. Let's see if that works. Can you see it? Is it up there? Coming. Good. Start from the beginning. From start at the beginning, said the Queen of Hearts, go through to the middle and finish at the end. Is that come up? <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about the new the need for a new financial paradigm and the systems plumbing to solve systems issues for systems for a systems opportunity. Like most things, let's start on the problem, and I'll go through these slides quite quickly because I want to get to the, to the roadmap that we talk about. We talk about sustainable development goals, but let's be clear what we mean by that. Uh, we throw these things around. What that actually means is mobilizing somewhere, but probably around about $4 trillion um, of capital per annum from where we are. Just to put that in context, that's 10, and a, 10 to 50% of all global trade flows five to 15% of capital market flows. And those figures ignore climate. It's been fudged within in that analysis. It ignores the fact we're using 1.7 times the world resources. It ignores huge unfunded pension liabilities and the huge growth of youth populations in the developing world. And it ignores black swan events like COVID uh, or indeed AMR, antimicrobial resistance, that could be anything up to $125 trillion problem just to really make your day. Uh, so the problem is huge in terms of the problem that we wish to solve. Uh, there is the money. Let's be, let's be optimistic. Let me just sort of very quickly run through. This is the money that we look at, the $135 billion from government, roughly $100 billion globally from foundations, half a trillion in remittances, $300 billion from individuals, highly fragmented, as, as Jack commented before. What is called SRI investment, which is really screening. DFI spend about $45 billion. This is what we currently mean by the, the impact debate, the, the blended debate as it's known. The green bond market, 150 billion. Microfinance, 50 billion, 35 billion. Uh, venture capital, probably around about 100 billion. And ESG, and I'll come back to that in a moment. That's what we mean when we talk about the figures for impact investment. And this is what I believe are the really big opportunities uh, the realignment of core foundation funds, the move to outcome models where we make the problem the opportunity. Uh, there is capital in the developing world, the South-South uh, transfers. There's roughly 2.3 trillion that sits in uh, local pension funds, primary in cash and local government bonds. There's a whole plethora of impact investment models, multi-billion dollar models, parabolic insurance, 4 trillion, uh, Islamic, 3 trillion. So you know, it's not a question that the trillions aren't there. The problem to Jack's point is that they're all siloed. Uh, this is what I call a mind map, what I used to when I was heading a product development unit inside the city. This is where we would break it down uh, in terms of analyzing risk and return. It really just gets to the point that uh, Jack was, was making before that we each pursue all that innovation, the collaboration, the metrics, the audit, the monetization, silo by silo, issue by issue. The whole process is siloed by issue, by process, by country. They're all unaligned. We have a metrics mechanism that doesn't unite us, it separates us. The current measurement process, to quote the chair of the International Accounting Standards Board, 
the current measurement process will not pr secure prioritization of planet over profit. Uh, the greenwashing is rampant. And that's reflected just to really make your day on the money side uh, in uh, an equal high degree of fragmentation. I won't run through these because we haven't enough time. But the basic core problem is that when you look at foundations and government and you look at the figures, they are flat or negative in real terms. The solution has to come from the finance sector and the corporate sector. But the finance sector has been driven now by really a one product of venture capital paradigm has, has taken over to uh, the detriment of, of many other potential developments. We see an awful lot of figures talked about ESG, but does that really reflect new money? I mean, I, I, I saw the GIN report come out the other day saying that the market was now 750 billion. So having compounded at a 45% growth rate since 2011, it's added another 40% on. And yet, if I read the UNCTAD report, the SDGs had gone from 2.5 trillion to $3 trillion, and probably with COVID at $4 trillion. Well, that either tells you that GIN's figures aren't really as dynamic and new money isn't being mobilized, or it tells you that the system is even worse than you thought. I'll leave that thought with you. But the reality is that COVID worsens all this scenario, the siloing of the money in small scale patterns. But let's think about impact as those series. Let's be very practical. If you take a look at innovation, we have innovations that, that intervene anywhere along that chain. But the reality is if you're an investor, you cannot control the return by a series of those individual innovations. They're great, but enough, something else along the chain or the system uh, will, will basically ensure that it's quite a high risky investment for you. And from a social perspective, we may do great work on one or two of these elements, but the reality is, is that another element uh, will fall over Kelter. So we have to look at these things uh, as, as complex systems issues. The prevailing grant PEC model cannot pay for or solve all these problems, as I noted before. The basic problem we have is that everything we seek uh, to fund is usually less than $100 million. Now, if you want to engage the capital market and the more sophisticated tool, it has to be at $100 million plus uh, if you want to enter those core financial markets and indeed to bring uh, the, uh, the, the, the widespread tools of the capital markets in play. And assuming that we manage to show the wherewithal to actually collaborate, the question you have to ask is, who is doing that aggregation and to whose benefit? Is it to the VCs? Is it to the benefit of the social entrepreneurs, the community? Well, let me put this thought out to you. Should it be perhaps for all stakeholders in an equitable way? If we're going to build this system, I'll go through this very quickly, we need to have a, uh, an agreement that the architecture we're building has these elements, specifically modular, scalable, interoperable, measurable, investable, uh, equitable, and to place the community at the center. These should be the ground rules uh, around which we build, because if we do not, we will simply create another platform, and platforms are multiplying probably faster than rabbits on Viagra. The last count I saw was roughly, <laughs> roughly 200 of them. So what's the, the opportunity um, in terms of, what's the opportunity uh, in terms of looking at a systems issue? I'll take WASH because it's Jack's favorite issue. When we make an intervention in water and sanitation, you make it in that silo. But what you realize if you enter water and sanitation is that it is 1,800 children dying a day. If you improve health, uh, you stop 35% of kids in slums from diarrheal diseases not getting their education. You produce educational improvements. If girls do well, that is the best indication for, for poverty. So the positive and the negative externalities are not priced uh, or financially looked at, nor indeed do we capture the value of everything that we create by an intervention. We put ourselves inside small silos, but not recognize actually that in water and sanitation's case, it's roughly a half a trillion dollars is the opportunity equally if we manage to um, actually aggregate that systems approach together. So there are huge opportunities in approaching these things on a systems basis. I don't seem yeah. to be moving. 
Now, there we go. Now, what I will take you through here is what this road looks like. We all talk about collaboration, but unless we actually have a legal mechanism that is inter, intra, and cross-sectoral, so you can aggregate and align the management structures in a mechanism where each stakeholder can take a different or indeed differing economic return as a function either as looking for investment or getting an investment, then you have a major problem in terms of actually how you do collaboration because you'll do it within a silo. You'll spend huge amounts of, of legal costs in terms of doing. So the first innovation that came out of the work of these five former regulators we were is this global legal structure that creates inter, intra and cross-sectoral collaboration. So anything you see here with a blue circle around is innovation. What I put in green is the technology that facilitates this process. And this process is not what we call a deductive process, which is what happens at the moment. At the moment, we would leave Plymouth, England, heading, because it's America, we're going to head to Plymouth in the United States. And as we get out into the middle of the Bay of Biscay, one person will ask, which way is uh, Plymouth in Massachusetts? Another will say, have you got an oar? Another will say, have you got food? Another will say, you've got a radio. But of course, the last person they want to collaborate with next door is, of course, the rowing boat next door, because that's your biggest competitor for capital. And it creates an incredibly fragmented, uncollaborative mechanism, because that's the incentive structure. However, if you look at the issue inductively, ergo, you know the way from Plymouth uh, to Plymouth, you would go through the same process, irrespective of whether you're a banker or a social sector, whatever. What's the innovation? How do you create the collaboration? How do you measure it? How do you create the old bet? How do you tactically fund it? And then how do you strategically fund it? That's the road that we all go down in our individual silos, but it's actually the plumbing to which Anand refers that we need to build. The first bit of that is the R&D and the client relationship management, because if you're actually gonna get people, you put them inside a legal framework where their incentives are aligned, where the social mission is hardwired, you then need a uh, knowledge management mechanism that would allow these groups to come together and collaborate. You need a financial due diligence mechanism that then allows you to financially identify the due diligence process. And that's all driven uh, by uh, a data process that allows you to identify, track and pay that granular innovation that you have given legal form in the structure which we mentioned before. You then need to say, well, actually, how do we measure it? Well, measurement cloud and mobile technology allows you to drive this down to the community itself. We don't do top down. We should do from bottom up, which is logically where we're all coming from. And as opposed to a metrics mechanism, which is siloed within its uh, issue silos, what we should actually be asking is, what is the metrics mechanism that unites us all? And I put it to you, what unites us all is the externalities. The fundamental problem of capitalism is that we do not recognize the positive and the negative externalities. So what you need to do, and this is reflected in how capital markets works as well, is a feedback mechanism directly from the community, not from top down, from the community. And what we measure is the progress towards the total externalities, so the total value of an intervention in water and sanitation. And you overlay that in a mechanism that is competitive and comparative. So you create a mechanism where you are paying by the delta of improvement. So you don't pay in the silo by the issue, you pay by the collaboration and the rate at which that collaboration is successful and you create a mechanism, as you do in the commercial sector, that is competitive and comparative. You push enough data through this, that becomes predictive. This is exactly the same model as Facebook, Google, but apparently not Mr. Trump and the Russians. The power is in the data. The power is in the collaboration. The measurement is made competitive and comparative. That then allows you to crystallize five economic values. One is the value of the innovation. Two is the value of that innovation replicated in other systems or other partnerships or indeed in other issues. 
Three, is it done in a cost structure that's efficient because you are not having to rebuild everything yourself. You can plug and play other people's capability. That larger collaboration allows you to move beyond venture capital tools to a whole range of capital market tools, of which not least is the valuation of the externalities. Now, the UN Secretary General has called for uh, the valuation of the externalities. I'm happy to tell you that a whole range of organizations have done that, including UN institutions. So we know that for every $1 we put into education in India, it generates $50 of future economic value. We know for every $1 we put into TV, it generates $45, you do it quicker, it's 85. We know that the total externalities in water and sanitation with a consensus from WHO, UNICEF and the World Bank is roughly $300, $400 billion per annum. So we know those are the cash flows foregone. The value is really in the externalities and in creating cost systems that are inefficient. So it's not just about applying subsidy, it's actually creating exactly as happened in banking, as exactly happens in any every sector uh, of, our, our, of our lives, whether it be booking.com, Uber, or any of these things, it's about creating a platform that allows you to aggregate that cost efficiency and cost structure. That then leads you to two financial tools, the ability to plug and play what other people have already built. So don't rebuild inside your silo, plug and play what other people have already built. And then the second concept is this concept of blue equity, which is an iteration of the social impact bond uh, I originally conceptualized at Ashoka, which says the value is in, as to repeat the point, in the externality. So how do you do that? You create a series of contingent payments from high net worth individuals, governments, corporates, foundations that would benefit out of addressing those externalities. That creates a cash flow. So that after cash, you can uh, summarize quickly. That Sorry. cash flow then creates a security that then reflects the value of the aggregation of the individuals you have above. So that is the roadmap uh, that, that I would argue we probably require. It's not just my work, it's the work of 22 organizations uh, and creates a mechanism that is collaborative, predictive, and crystallizes the economic value. So it gets us away from the siloing to collaborating and working together, recognizing that systems approaches have value, are less risky, and you make them tradable. I'll leave you with one slide, which is the critical question in this equation, because this is what the bankers have already built and done. Let me repeat that. This is what the banker sector has already more or less built, but placing them as the principal in this transaction. This is a picture of the Chateau de Chillon that controlled one of the, trading, the trade flows between North and South Europe. It's why the Swiss are rich. It's the same today. Whoever controls the data frame will control the game. So it is critical that the data frame is actually controlled by our sector for the benefit of our sector uh, and is a public good, not a private good. Thank you. I shall Thank shut you up now, much. Jack. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur. Uh, so to summarize, Arthur has uh, given us a lot of points. Uh, one of the things is that we didn't price the externality. So can we, uh, can we switch to normal again? Uh, the slide's over. So um, we didn't price the external. So when we have uh, a problem, each of these problem, whether it's energy, water, sanitation, healthcare, education, transport, housing, logistic, finance, all these things that are basic and needs uh, of the poor, the 4 billion people that are earning less than $8 a day, they are partly private goods and they are partly public goods. For example, pollution is a public good, but it's not price. Poverty is also a public good, which a polluted water full of shit is also a public good. But these are not priced and only private goods are priced. This is why uh, this 
conversation is so important because we have to make sure that we price both negative and positive externality that is caused by the problem. So not solving education actually costs more than solving education. Not having toilet kills 2 million people on diarrhea and it's more costly than having sanitation. So what I, I would like now to do is to um, ask the participant to briefly uh, introduce themselves and uh, to enter the conversation. How do you feel about this? And uh, you can un unmute yourself and uh, join us. A anybody like to uh, start to, to ask some questions? Please do that. You can also do it on the chat function. Um, anybody? Uh, are you allowed to unmute yourself or the host? Can you help? Hi, I'm Lucy. Um, I uh, spent about 20 years with Ashoka, um, spent about eight years in the business sector, finance sector before that. Um, and running my own nonprofit before that. I'm still interested and fascinated. I know um, Arthur from many years ago, um, and I've heard of you, Jack, for a long time. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm very interested in what you're talking about and how this all fits together. Money matters. <laughs> and, and how do you see this happening? People always say they want to collaborate, but eventually they don't. They are so worried about oh my donor will then be shared with other people and they're so worried about their ego i have worked so hard to build this thing and now i got to share but if they don't share they become the obstacle to their mission how do you see this uh, as a how do we unblock this mindset There are examples of organizations that have done this well. And so um, it would be interesting to take a look at some of those models and see if they make sense. Finance obviously has to be a big part. Ego, also a big part, dealable. But there are ways that you can put in place a chance for people to, to, to deal with that. But in any case, I'm very interested in learning uh, what what everybody's been talking about. Thank you very much. I I think you are part of our conversation already. Uh, just a few hours ago, we are in another conversation. But I think that there is a solution when we mass customize the incentive for each of the stakeholder. Uh, actually, it is possible to mobilize them because the profit is in the synergies between each other. When they come together, they're going to produce more. It's just like you put a woman and a man together and you have many more babies instead of just two human beings. So in, in this ecosystem approach, we unlock the synergies and we reduce the wastages, the redundancy, the duplication, the cause of mistrust. And I think all this can be monetized into, into money, but we need now the, ge the genius of Anand, Atterwood, Fadrick, Jiru, yourself, all the people coming together in a common mission so that if we don't think we are belonging to our own organization, but we are belonging to humanity and we want to solve end poverty, I think it's not very difficult because the status quo is much more complicated than the ecosystem. Yeah. Now, anybody else uh, would like to say something? Uh, please join hi, us in... Uh, hi, Jack. Yes. Hi, Jack and everyone. <clears throat> this is Carol. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, great. Yes, so this is, uh, I 100% I agree with all of everything that everyone has just said. Um, and I have thought a lot about this and really am very 
focused on dealing with the challenges to doing this, which in my country, United States of America, has, uh, you know, the people that benefit from not pricing the externalities don't want to price the externalities. We can look at climate and the years and years and years of trying to price the externalities. So I think, you know, there's been great progress with climate, climate risk, water risk, but I believe that the value of working together, I mean, the model that Arthur just talked about and Anand's together, I mean, bringing these things together, we can do this, but we also have to um, collectively figure out how to not allow the folks that have a vested interest in not pricing the externalities to um, um, get away with murder. Keep the keep keep the momentum from happening. Let's put it that way. Um, so I just want to riff on a couple of things I heard. This is like a little bit stream of consciousness. I worked at AT and T for many years and loved Bell Labs. I mean, I was in love with them. And the reason is because it was a bunch of guy. You know, I hate to say it, it was mostly men at the time. But you know, a bunch of people um, just with unlimited budget following their dream of figuring out some crazy technical problem. And they were funded by big, deep pocketed monopoly AT&T. So they could just, they didn't actually have metrics. They didn't have impacts. They didn't have to report to anyone. And all of this amazing stuff came out of there. That's one point just to riff on Arthur talking about the, the um, R&D issue. And I do think that, um, you know, obviously there's challenges because we do need impacts, but that's like a big key that we need governments to then going into the blended finance idea. I, I come from fundraising. I've been doing fundraising. So I keep thinking, why don't we have one huge fund for every SDG where going to the point of the competitiveness and fundraising where you take that away because you know if you're fundraising for water i don't think it's an issue of mistrust jack like jack said you know because of mistrust it's an issue of just competition for the funds and you know one organization has a good relationship with the funder that's going to benefit them and the other one you know might not get that money so why not have just a big blended finance fund for every SDG? I don't know how, you know, obviously that takes all the big players um, involved and all the governments involved. And then the final thing I'll, I have other things to say, but the final thing I'll say regarding silos. Over the past 20 years, I've had a number of interviews with executive search firms. And th that is exactly what they do. They go, have you done X, Y, Z before? And, and it's almost like corporate America is set up to silo culturally folks to be working in this one tunnel. I mean, fundraising is so general and maybe now 10 years later, well, I, I got involved about 15 years ago. 15 years ago, I came from the corporate world. The, not, the social sector did not wanna to talk to you if you hadn't already fundraised. And so I think the silo issue, I mean, I pretty much believe that everyone thinks that's a problem and that's something we can easily work out of. But wow, culturally, you know, it needs to come from every angle. So this is super exciting to me and I wanna be involved and let's do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's so much energy <laughs> coming <laughs> from you. So happy. Uh, anybody else, please? Uh, this is a small group. You have a, a privilege to speak up and uh, to go on the recording because in big groups, you, you never get the chance. You can only do chat uh, conversation. Who else? I'd like to just, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm really so thrilled that I happened to see the post and came in. Um, I'm working, I'm at Skydeck, which is an accelerator at, uh, I'm actually just in the hot desk because it's a, you know, sort of an NGO effort, but um, for, uh, we're trying to do basically OkCupid for um, 
benefactors and beneficiaries we, uh, and our target market to start with is um, like CSR in India. So we're working with corporate funders or other benefactors and then vetted grassroots organizations and our whole, like our big, you know, future planning is sort of to have the money to try to route the money towards the SDGs or the development goals of India you know, where it's most needed. So that's like our long-term plan. So this is the greatest presentation ever. I'm so totally in. Uh, can I have your name, please? My name is Cara Ariano. Uh, Cara Ariano, okay. We Thank just you very much. got on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago. Good, good, good. So thank you very much because uh, there's also another Indian friend on the, on the, on the audience, uh, Satya Ji, would you like to uh, to speak something? Introduce hi. yourself. Hi, hi, Gara. Camera? Can you go on yeah. camera? Maybe it's... you didn't shave today. <laughs> hi, guys. Uh, so, hi, Jack. It's always good to see you. Uh, so, basically, I run a startup called uh, San Ocean. Uh, and uh, incidentally, it was founded uh, with Jack, you know, over a conversation. And uh, so I'm a product designer and we build uh, products to life, like right from uh, innovation, right from the start to the end and bring it to market. So the first product that we built was actually uh, the new age Indian squat toilet, which, which went on to be sold in the market. It's called Squat Ease. And now we're building a shoe. For, for children who don't have shoes. And we're seeing how we can bring that to life. And you know, there are about 380 million uh, children who don't have access to footwear and that causes a lot of problems. So Jack and I were ideating, he's on our ideation team and that's how we keep building some things, get them patented. The, our last product was actually awarded by the prime minister in India uh, under the Swachh Bharat innovation program. We launched at Kum with about 12,000 units and uh, so San Ocean meaning Sano meaning healthy and Notion meaning ideas, getting healthy ideas to life is, is the concept. So that's what I do and I wanted, it's always good to be in company of people who, you know, who are talking about problems. And my job so is- I think to you, you can uh, get in touch with uh, uh, Kara and yeah. maybe you can private chat with her uh, on the chat function and get the uh, contact with each other, yeah. Anybody oh. else uh, would like to uh, to join the conversation, Anna or Leila? I have a couple also, of things to add once they're done. Yes, please, Anan, you continue. If they, anybody wants to speak, please uh, speak up. Yes, Anan, please continue. Yeah, so no, I was... Uh, it, it's interesting what you said, Carol, and I, I'd love your thoughts on a couple of things. One is, see, I'm a newcomer to this ecosystem. And uh, as soon as we came in, we were sort of in, inducted into this idea that funding rules, right? Uh, and then I realized that funding also bends your will. Um, and then I realized that funding, uh, you know, sort of changes the theory of change. Um, essentially, the theory of change follows funding rather than funding following the theory of change, which is quite sad, actually, as a, as a person who was so enamored by looking at how amazing some organizations were in their ability to fully comprehend the complexity of a problem and construct these really uh, nice, well-articulated theories of change uh, to empower communities. So when we started looking at it, one of the things about funding, yeah, and I'm I'll be honest with you, I'm not, I'm not uh, funding, well, I'm not very well versed in funding. But the question we asked is, these are also some anecdotes. Some of the funders, particularly the non-big funders, so there's the $50 billion and then there's the 1 million and 5 million. The 1 million and the 5 millions basically have been expressing saying, look, we're losing touch with philanthropy, meaning that we're not here to sign checks. We want to know what the impact is, right? And the more these ideas tend into centralization, I think we will not just lose the, uh, the, the work on the ground, we'll also lose these small philanthropists. Because for them to put their money into, into a big box and the box gets divided in ways that I have no idea what my impact was, I think is very impersonal for funders, smaller funders. The second thing is that also 
excludes, it becomes an exclusive club and it excludes people who want to participate. I see in India, I see in Seattle, I live in Seattle and I travel back and forth to Bangalore about uh, every month until COVID hit. And we used to find that there's huge enthusiasm to give. There's massive enthusiasm to give. But their ability to participate is curtailed by these big initiatives, right? So my question is, how long will we keep consolidating and creating big funds and super funds? To be honest with you, if you take people in the social sector and give them lots of money, they will also screw it up. Right? I think humans are humans on both sides. Uh, power, with power comes, uh, you know, irresponsible actions. It's just, we're all, I think I was telling somebody, the only way to get rid of human suffering is to get rid of humans. Otherwise, suffering is a free gift. You know, right? you know, it's, that's such... I, <laughs> I'm going to just say, I agree with you. I agree with everyone so far. Um, the way I look at it, it's like a portfolio approach. You know, it's just as basic as that. It's, you have the big funds. I, so I had, I worked for some time with an organization called Water Foundation. They're a funder and they, basically their model was a pooled fund. And their pooled fund was anchored by all of the big environmental funders. So there's, I believe there's a lot of funders, big ones, big progressive ones that care about changing the world, like really changing, not just, you know, picking projects. I believe that there's room for the big funders to do some kind of pooled fund based on SDGs and the idea of the uh, impact is in, this, is in the synergies in between the co collective action collaboration. But then to your point, you have to bring in everyone. You know, this is why the individual is so important. When, when I just do just, gen, you know, fundraising 101, you've got government funding, which is like the big, really bureaucratic, difficult stuff that takes a year to write a proposal. You know, then you've got your foundations, that's relationship building. Then you have your um, corporations, which is a whole different animal with, you know, mission fit. Then you've got your individuals. So there's room for all of those individuals to come in. There's so much, um, innovation you know in terms of getting them in the door whether it's through like a vc model or a, a, an impact investing model or just a general philanthropic model I, I tend to really feel like conveners that we trust it's it there's a role for them in pressing into this systemic change. And that's why the Skull Catalyst, Ashoka, you know, this collaboration is so amazing. It just needs, it needs to be scaled up. Like their work needs to be scaled up um, to bring in others. So I think, you know, what you're talking about with uh, Anand, with, your, with what you're doing is so fantastic because it is the data, it's the externalities. If you look at climate, and impact investing. I mean, they've been fighting this battle for years, you, you know, and, and finally there's money coming in only because they have proven that the returns are the same as the general market. That's why the money's coming in. I mean, we want to say we care about social problems and I'm sure we all do, but they still want to see the returns. Where I know less is what Arthur's talking about and I'm very, very, keen on learning more about blended finance and how how that all works in the portfolio of funding so um so i don't want to disenfranchise and i also look at like capital markets look at capital markets when you have an ipo i i actually got into that dutch auction with google remember back in uh whatever year that was they tried to get the little guy involved in their IPO through this Dutch auction process because generally Wall Street disenfranchises the little guy. They don't get the gains, you know, on the on the uh, early in IPOs. So, um, so I think platforms, you know, could do a really amazing job at bringing them in and more fully invested, more totally, holistically, you know, mm. on board. Okay. Can Thank I possibly you. can I possibly make a couple of points, Jack? Yes, please. Let, let's. The fault, dear Brutus, lies not amongst the stars; it lies amongst ourselves. If you look at the total amount of subsidies inside the system, 
strategic subsidies. So in the United States, what? You do roughly $300 billion in giving away every year. 5% of that heads up internationally. Uh, most goes into education, health, and religion. And when you take a look at the strategic subsidy around the issues that we're really talking about, climate and, and systemic change, there's 170 billion inside the UN, there's 100 billion inside the World Bank, there's 50 billion inside uh, fam, uh, DFIs, 100 billion globally, say, around foundations. Those foundations to which we refer are equally highly fragmented. Gates's total giveaway in one year is what the Pentagon spends in 36 hours. Just let that sink in. What Gates does, and we all worship at the court of Gates in our sector, is what the Pentagon spends in 36 hours. Now, if the problem is a $3 trillion or $4 trillion problem, $350 billion worth of strategic subsidy would mean you would have to leverage that capital 10 times. It would mean nobody would get paid. And worst of all, everybody would have to agree. It is not going to happen by 2030. The statistics tell you it's 0.4 to 1.17, and possibly four. We've done deals that do get four times leverage. But it just statistically tells, you know, either let's get rid of 2030 and stop talking about the SDGs or recognize that there are two other elements in here. One is about the innovation. I'm, you know, having been at Ashoka, I'm a passionate believer in the innovation. Somebody just said, you mentioned his brilliant innovation as well. Innovation is, is what we encourage. And we re, what happens in our sector as well is we reinvent that wheel over and over and over again in some cases, in different countries, different, different localities. Capitalism grows through that innovation, but it also grows through scale and collaboration. We work in a system which, if, which you learn in Economics 101, very high marginal cost, very low marginal revenue, and very few annuity models that work in scale. What we have to do is to create a mechanism whereby we actually aggregate, we collaborate, we drive economic efficiency in, into the mechanism. And we don't reinvent the wheel all the time. Yep. Arthur, uh, I'd like to ask you, um, what is the thing that will make this collaboration happen? Mr. Trump, the first thing he did when he moved into his office was to move the statue of Ted Roosevelt in. Teddy Roosevelt had a very famous comment that's been used by both people on Leicester Night, which is, when you've got them by the balls, the hearts and minds will follow. So what it means you've got to do is to change what we, what we call incentives in our sector. At the moment, we are not incentivized to collaborate together. We are not paid for collaborating and working together. Lucy's right, there are models. But as a sector generally, we are not incentivized to collaborate and work together. Water and sanitation is a classic case in point. As you know, Jack, one dollar goes into well, san sanitation and then to wash. So what you have to do is to crystallize the total value of that collaboration. And the total value of that collaboration is measured in terms of what we do, is measured in its impact on the externalities. That's the economic so opportunity. has that been calculated? Sorry? Has that externality yes, it's been, been calculated? Guy Hutton has done it in water and sanitation. It's called the Joint, oh. Mo joint Monitoring Program. We, we know Great. what the total value of the problem is. Those are lost Why cash flows. Just less, as as uh, uh, Carol Di Benedetto has said, why don't we take each of the SDG, price it uh, in terms of the externality, and say, today, you didn't solve it, but you thought you're spending nothing, but actually this negative externality is what you are spending, which is much bigger than you would spend to solve it. Well, I, and I, then once people can see that in the narrative that it's clear, we should be able to sell it. Is that not true? Well, if well, the, the reality is that we work in a market where different players want different or indeed differing economic return. The people in ODI important? are at minus 100. If you're a corporate, you want 12%. So you have to construct a mechanism yes. which reflects the incentive structure of each of those players but where yes. they are incentivized to work together and that their and value of collaboration, this, their value is in their collaboration. This, you have designed this uh, system already, right? Yes, exactly. 
And the, the good thing is that most of this $50 million worth of built technology in the silos has already been built. So the vast majority of this system has been built. So what do you need? What do you need? To do? We need case studies. And the, and, the, and the irony is that everybody talks about systems approaches. But I can tell you, actually trying to get people to think on a systems basis, ergo a city or around a, a particular issue, is very difficult because everybody comes to this from their own individual silo and funding. Their own we own. have the Catalyst 2030 because we want to change the mindset. And that's the reason that I'm here, Jack. <laughs> You know, it's interesting because I, I'm new to this group and I, again, my context being years at AT&T where pilots were the king. I mean, I did a tiny pilot that turned into, you know, a billion dollar deal. For me, that's a lot of money, right? But, but in, the catalyst, in the catalyst world, pilots are like a bad word. I've learned a little bit. And so I think, I think that when Arthur says we need case studies, I do believe we need to do pilots, not pilots that are disbanded at the end, but really smart pilots where um, Anand was saying we keep the artifacts and share it. And again, I hate to be so like rudiment, um, rudimentary, but you, you need it to be funded because Jack, you know, is out there doing toilets. He's not gonna have time to do all this. and. Someone needs to step up with some funding to put it together to uh, to get the case study so that we can make this happen. Mm -hmm. And and transparency is a huge part of it. Mr. Trump has done an amazing job at making everyone mistrust everything. So the only way you get around that is transparency. And I and I'd love to understand what Arthur has to say about like where does blockchain well fix. Fit into this, but anyway, that's a whole other conversation. Well, we could we could have a conversation because it is actually fundamental. Yeah, we'll take this offline. Um, well, can, can, can no, I add a I point? Can I can I make a point? Because it's a critical project. What technology yeah. has done is two things. It has given us the ability to manage complexity, and increasingly so with artificial intelligence. One, and the second thing it's done, and this is it's not actually blockchain; it's distributed ledger technology, is the ability to track granular value through a complex system. Mm -hmm. That means you can track an individual social entrepreneur or process you can track it give it legal form and pay it yeah so. and that's the critical so big bit. and small can join and have equal influence i think this is good transparency yeah. i like to ask a a two person susan is doing all this bicycle and uh monique is uh, uh somebody from formerly singularity university well how are your point of view after listening to this please uh, give us your feedback you can unmute yourself uh, Monique and uh, Susan Bonstein maybe they're not ready to, to speak up <laughs> If, if somebody needs to unmute, uh, somebody can help unmute Monique. I think she wants to say something. Yes. She's on the cell phone. Let me see if I can. Uh... Can you yeah. unmute her? Ah, perfect. Thank you for doing that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Monique? Yes, yes great. Hi, everyone. Oh, yeah, I've got... Um, uh, I've got my picture up there because I'm looking at you all through my computer, but uh, my audio is only coming through on a cell phone. So, um, no, I, I put a comment in, you know, first I, I just wanted to say, you know, Arthur, your presentation was, was deeply enlightening for me and I would like to learn more. Um, I, I want to, I mean, you know, off the cuff, um, I like, yes, go, let's do it. I'm excited. Like, absolutely. But really the, you know, I hate to use the expression, but the devil's in the details and it's like, okay, how does this really come together? And, and what's the plan and steps, you know, that we pull together to make it happen. And that's, you know, I think that comes from, um, you know, more education. And so I'm, I'm keen to learn more there. Um, you know, my, my particular background, I, I built uh, SU Ventures, so Singularity University Ventures. And we looked at, you know, models where we were investing in innovation. So startups at the intersection of technology. So like artificial intelligence, synthetic biology and impact. Um, and, you know, which were aligned to the SDGs. And it was interesting as, 
as we were trying to fund these companies, you know, I, I resonate with there's all this capital out there. And, you know, if they were, if these innovation, these startups were ready for pure play VC, they were completely not fundable, you know, by uh, the other trillions of dollars in, in the philanthropic sector and vice versa. But yet they were still trying to solve, you know, I saw these entrepreneurs trying to solve these big problems using innovation, but getting completely lost in the mess of venture capital. Um, or if they took in, you know, money, um, you know, from, you know, from the philanthropic space in some way, you know, venture capital kind of looked, kind of snubbed them in some ways. And so these hybrid models, you know, we spent time looking at and how do you, you know, how do you create sort of a, a capital stack, you know, along the timeline and trajectory of a business that one, creates sustainability so you can bring these projects to life, um, but two, you know, keeps investors in the game and keeps people believing that, um, you know, that these, these bigger problems are worth solving and also keeps the entrepreneur from completely, you know, becoming disillusioned. And then, and then to Jack's very, very first point, like, you know, closing the doors and then somebody reinvents the, tries to reinvent the exact same wheel all over again. Um, so yes, these are complex problems. Um, and um, I like, I love, I'm sort of, I mean, I don't love the, the Roosevelt quote, but I get the essence of it, like forcing people to, you know, and not forcing, but deeply aligning an incentive to get people to work together, I think is really the only way forward because, you know, it's too easy to say, yes, it's a big problem. Yes, it's a big problem. Um, but I don't know what to do. And, and I think what, versus saying, okay, yes, it's a big problem. And okay, I've got to do this just because like, this is what needs to be done. Thanks, nice to meet you all. Uh, thanks, Monique. Uh, I will, I will follow up with you and connect you to Arthur so you can uh, learn uh, much more about the, uh, his model. Uh, it's very deep, Perfect. but uh, you will understand because you, you have been everywhere, you know all this stuff. Uh, <laughs> anybody else uh, wants to contribute or Anand, would you like to add on something? Yeah, I mean, um, it's interesting. I mean, I think I'm looking at this from two sides. I'm, I'm equally a participant here and I'm interested in everything that you guys are saying. And I have a very honest question and partly because, and forgive the naivety with which I probably asked this question. I, we, we had a very simple principle. We learned a few things. I was head of innovation for a bank and uh, everybody talks about innovation as it's this thing that's amazing, but don't realize how hard it is to come by in any meaningful way. Um, so we used to say two, three things. Number one, we used to say, don't throw ideas over the wall, throw the owner with it, right? Uh, we basically said there are tons of people with great ideas. Nobody wants to do it. So it's really important to find the person that really wants to do it. Otherwise that idea is worth nothing. That is one part, right? Um, and the second thing that we found is that the due diligence journey that you have to go through. I was talking to one guy who sold Vizio to Microsoft long time ago, almost 20 years ago, I remember. And he said something brilliant. He said, most startups fail because, um, you know, there are three stages. Uh, do you like it? Will you use it? Will you pay for it? Right. And he says, most of the failures happen because they put their wife's jewelry and their house on the, uh, you know, mortgage into the startup on phase one. When somebody says, yeah, I love it. This is a great idea. And they just go dump all their money. In it, right. So what I'm saying is that actually the, what I'm finding in this sector sometimes is a lot of money goes in very early into the process. Uh, and, and these MOUs that get signed with states, uh, there are these really, I mean, so quickly, they put millions of dollars into something. There is no due diligence. There is no, the system is not paying for it. And therefore their system, like the procurement process, their internal financial controls haven't really scrutinized the contract. And I find that this, this whole lack of scrutiny is causing a massive amount of effort that has no chance of succeeding because the idea of creating product market fit, that journey is very hard to circumvent, right? However brilliant you think you are. And until you're able to go through those little nitty gritty details and arrive at a point, and when you arrive at that point, the one that scales is the simplest idea. I and mean, one thing we, so I was part of this initiative called Societal Platform. And one of the things I realized coming out of that was that actually the only solutions that manage to reach scale and have an impact at scale are things what we call today disappointingly simple solutions. 
Because imagine if it takes days for us to explain it to a group of five people, how long will it take for you to explain it to a billion people? It's impossible. So how do we translate all of this amazing knowledge into something very fundamental and simple to a product or a service? And how do you monetize that? Um, last example I'll leave you with, which really I find this contradiction when we start to create these massive ideas uh, that only few people can execute. Is we saw this whole transformation in India around uh, Ubers and the Olas, right? And I can tell you, people forgot. 10 years ago, they would say, oh, people don't have phones. It won't work. It won't work. Guess what? Go and look. They own two phones because they're running Ola on this side and Uber on this side, right? Why? Because they, they, those guys are so intuitively tuned into livelihood. The minute they realize that I can make a livelihood impact using this thing that you're peddling, right? I'll go buy a phone. Right. Phone is not a privileged device. Right. It can become a necessary device provided there is value coming out of that phone. Yeah. So my question is, where are those business models? What is that business model that you can explain to a farmer, not to a banker, to a farmer and say, take this. Will you pay for this? And I'm telling you, we're seeing this today that it's actually easier to explain to a farmer why they should buy a phone than to explain to a funder why they should give a phone to a farmer. Yeah, I can, think that. Can, uh, can I can I can I have an interjection there, Jack? Please. Yeah, we're, we're dealing as much as I would love it to be. Do the simple thing, and undoubtedly that that it, that is true. What we're dealing with is a complex systems issue. But the reality is is that this has been done in every other sector of the economy. And I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was working in banking, and as I said, I was head of product development and e-commerce. We decided having improved the product development process and we got it from one product every 18 months to roughly one product, six products in, in about 12 weeks. The, the, the next rational step, and this is what everybody did in banking. So this is not just what we did. We had four or five separate business lines, each with their own brands, their own processes, their own systems. What we said we would do is integrate it on a single integrated data platform. We cleaned up the data. We use customization, which allowed us to plug and play other people's capabilities. So we could upgrade the proposition from brochureware to trading to hedge funds to all of which we were insourcing from somebody else to then getting down to cost structures, upgrading the process. Personalization on the front end allowed us to then adapt it to each of the individual market segments. And we then data mine the interreactions to identify the various business segments we would wish to do. It is very similar to what you see in development today, except with the benefit of distributed ledger technology and mobile, it now allows us to actually drive it into the individual constituents in our world. Ergo, we can create a feedback loop directly from the community, the customer themselves. So the, the problem is exactly analogous. You know, you have a series of fragmented lines which you can now aggregate, upgrade, allow them to keep their own identity, refine the proposition, and increase the sophistication of that process. And that process of personalization, customization, mobile, has been the same things that have driven Uber, Facebook, and every other model that we take for granted in our everyday life. But we don't seem to want to apply it to development, and that's because the financial incentives are wrong. There is a reason that AT&T and all these firms boomed in the in late years. It's because their cost of capital was next to zero, because people could see that if they were the first in that development loop, and they could build in 12 months as opposed to 18 months, then skimming the market, they were going to take market share and own it. And what we saw in the last 10 years has been the creation of natural monopolies on that basis but it was built on a huge pool of cheap capital because people perceived the opportunity of the growth and the aggregations of those markets. The same opportunity exists in our space, but the incentives are not aligned for us to, to do it. No, I think we can change that, Arthur. Uh, you are, uh, already have a plan. I'm a storyteller. I'll make your plan become very simple language. And people will start to understand, ah, this is what is it. And then once they want to know deeper, they go to ask you. And I'll happily confuse them, Jack. <laughs> Jack, 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 Jack,
Uh, no, no. <laughs> we just uh, only, only he can uh, quote Teddy Roosevelt without flinching. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I have a point. See, um, after that, I think you know I'd love to continue this discussion as well. See, the thing is this: that we're finding that there is different scales of scale. Um, I've seen organization scale. I've seen integrated systems. I'll be honest with you: that's tiny, so tiny. In terms of money, it might be big. In terms of people reached, it's tiny. What we're talking about is 600 million people who are going to grow up if you don't reach them in the next two years, right? Okay. That's, that's the size we have to talk about. And there, my argument is, if you look at India, for example, the few things that have scaled, like passports, the idea of a passport scales, not because everybody has a record of everybody with passport, is because the individual has a passport and when they take it, right, you can interact with them at the point that they interact with you, you get their information. That's one idea. Second is, if you look at telecom in India, it has a very different model to AT&T and it's scaled. It has more customers than any other organization in the world. Why? They reach 600 million people in a matter of 10 or 15 years, whereas consumer product companies who've been here for 50 years haven't reached more than 150, 200 million people. What's the difference? Well, Airtel in India took away the complexity and instead of doing all of this, sold SIM cards through little shops, right? And that guy made money out of refilling those SIM cards. So they turned it into a small micro business opportunity for that individual. And that took off. And I can tell you, I was there when that happened. And so many organizations I was advising and saying, how did they get to 600 million people in so many years? We've been trying for 50 years and we haven't got to 100 million, right? So what I'm saying is we need to talk about scale, not in terms of volume of money, but in terms of scale of number of people actually that are receiving and have the impact. And when you look at it from that perspective, we call it the first mile perspective, which is instead of thinking them as last mile and recipient, go to their side. Actually, complexity is the least from their point of view. When we look at it from this side, we call it complex, right? It's super complex because I have to figure out what 140,000 people are doing. You go and ask them, they will tell you today, I need this. No, I and think, if you can learn to operate from that side, I think the game ch changes. I think Anand, uh, uh, the conversation is uh, coming from both sides, but it's actually the same conversation. Uh, I uh, grew up as a very poor uh, boy in a very extremely poor family in a slum. And we know that uh, Singapore did not accept foreign aid. And it became rich because it unlocked the spirit of enterprise of the poor people and their good work ethics. And the money is always in the desire. If you think about how poor people can have cell phones, they don't have money, but how do they have cell phones? They say it's a necessity. And then because it's a necessity, they start to earn more money, think in a different way. I, I go to the slum and I ask, why are your children so small needing to carry a handphone to the school? And they say if they don't carry handphone, all the other kids will laugh at them. This is not rational, but they will find money for that. And they will find the money because necessity is the mother of invention. And we know that all poor family are mostly more entrepreneurial because they are more hungry. And if we give them access to opportunity, it is so much better than give them access to grants and donations. In fact, if we could transform the whole world donation into investment to build the capacity, to build the roads that you say, not just the cars and to build uh, this big collaborative infrastructure, then I think that we would solve this problem. The problem with the development sector that it is designed to please the donor. And if the donor gets some papers, 500 pages of McKinsey report or whatever, they're very happy. Then we have this continuation of the dysfunctional marketplace. But if everybody ends up doing business, employing people, we don't need to donate any more money. So the reality is that the people the money is in their head and is in their hands. And we have to unlock it. And one more point is about, while you're doing innovation, 
I am an advocate of copying because innovation is only filling up the gap, but the bulk of it is the ideas that have already been innovated. After it's innovated, then you copy and you replicate. Okay, Kara, please speak up. I just, right. I'm so motivated. I mean, I'm really happy to be listening to this. Um, I, th I think I mentioned in the chat, like what we're doing with Donmatch um, is we're using mobile technology, the same sort of that they're using to do like work trackers. Um, so that small NGOs in the field can collect, you know, objective evidence that I hope is used in lieu of the 47 page grant applications not including supporting documentation right so that they're over time proving their case through like evidence you know like repeated evidence and the whole thing is like you know multiple languages so that people can actually access it not behind a paywall and stuff so what you're saying i mean i'm getting super mood i'm like mm. i'm totally moved over here uh and just looking forward to continuing the conversation can Thank I suggest you. that in answer to that, Caro, if you can then make the data competitive and comparative between one region and another region, and you can identify what that allows you to do is to create a funding mechanism where you know for each dollar you're putting in, how much incremental social benefit you're buying. And if you can do that, it totally changes the, the, the financing dynamic. I, l I love the contrast uh, between Arthur and, and my thinking. My brain's going the other way, but I think it's an and proposition. Um, so what we found is, for example, capacity building being a very large part. People collect lots of data, but that data doesn't benefit the individual. So we turned around and asked saying, if you've been trained for 10 years as a Christian Mitra or a frontline worker in water or sanitation or something, how have you benefited from that training as a livelihood proposition? And it turns out, and we saw this in Africa, we're working with Stellenbosch in Africa, with John Hopkins in uh, Zambia and so on. And so we, what we've started is we said, what if we first and foremost give that information back to that individual as proof that they've been trained? What if they can go and say, look, I've been trained by John Hopkins and Harvard and so on and so forth. Can I monetize this? So this is currently running. So this is the point about, I think about data is, Data, if it flows up, actually has very little value from an impact perspective. But question is, no data is flowing down. It's not going back to the person who is the data, literally. So there are two elements to this always. I think the, the gravity today is upwards, right? I think we need to shift that gravity back downwards and say the minute data is generated, the person who is the subject of that data should know and have the ability to assert their own qualification. Imagine today's social sector is the only sector where millions of frontline workers are underemployed. Can you imagine the tech sector, the financial sector would be what it is if all the engineers could not be found and if they didn't have jobs? It makes no sense. And we're trying to build, I was drawing a picture the other day. I said, we're trying to build towers on a foundation of matchsticks. We need these frontline workers to do the amazing work that they do, but we don't worry about their jobs. They're all underemployed and they're being paid. Somebody told me last thing, somebody told me saying, oh, in our work, we employ women, mostly women are gender impact, blah, 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 amazing. You know, there's a whole market for this gender impact. When we went and met them, you know what we found? None of the men want that job. You know why? Because it pays very little. Now you tell me, are we exploiting those women or are we actually helping them? <laughs> Now, I'm, I'm telling you with this with a sense of responsibility because those women want that job. Don't mistake me. They want that job. But can you imagine we're paying them a tenth of what any man in that community would accept for doing that job? How are we adding to justice? So it's really important for us to really start being very honest with these conversations saying, if information is only flowing up, how long will it take before it flows back down and helps that individual? Yeah. Right. And how do we but, use data uh, to empower the individual rather than the organization? Anand, that also very important, and we will also use that and and solve the problem because I think the issue is communication. Because once people hear it, they'll be moved by it, and you have to he you have to go to the type of people who, after they are moved by it, is can act right. So. 
this is a job of selling ideas in a comprehensive manner. And I think we can do that. It's not, not so bad. Uh, we are right now at uh, 90 minutes, and so I have to call to the close. But I think it's a very pleasant uh, conversation, and everybody contributed very well. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy uh, with my two uh, panelists. And, and uh, I'll just ask them each to say something in 30 seconds. How do they feel now? I'll just say by myself, I feel that we are already an ecosystem, even in this small group. And I'd like to say I appreciate very much. So, Anand? No, no, I, I've said enough. I really appreciate it. I think I love the enthusiasm more than anything else. I love the energy that uh, everybody is sharing so freely in this uh, conversation. So thank you for being here. And uh, Arthur? The opportunity lies in collaboration and scale and the incentives to collaborate and scale. And economically, that makes sense. Um, socially, it makes sense. It actually makes sense to all the stakeholders. The hmm. problem we face is not money, it is not innovation, it is actually change management, ultimately. And that's the challenge. I also like to report that we already uh, did two connections. So Monique Gigi is going to talk to Arthur uh, on the chat group, and um, Satyajit is uh, going to talk to Trudy Bishop uh, on email. So you see, we've done some business uh, even while we are talking. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, please stay in touch with Catalyst 2030 and uh, ask us anything uh, even without this session. Thank you and bye-bye. Excellent, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Jack.